Thank you for staying with us. During the week, the World Bank in its Nigeria development update released a report that surging in inflation is undermining the recovery of Africa's biggest economy. That is Nigeria. Take it or leave it. Nigeria is still the biggest economy in Africa. We're not arguing. Well, even though sometimes we wonder. <laughs> <laughs> now that, of course, that report also said it's pushed 7 million Nigerians into poverty and encouraging criminality. Increasing criminality, if I may add, as rising prices deplete already meager incomes. So, of course, the president, during his Democracy Day speech last week, said his administration has lifted 10.5 million Nigerians out of poverty, out of 100 million promised over the next 10 years. How has that happened? And how come what we have is what we have? Two gentlemen join us this morning to look at surging inflation and poverty. Johnson Chuku is MD, Kauri Asset Management Limited, as well as Dr. Fashua, who is an economist. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank for being here morning. with us this morning. Fashua is actually with us in Lagos. Oh, yeah, she, is. she hasn't been here <laughs> in maybe about two years. <laughs> no, you know, <laughs> when, when you contest to be president, you want to be at the seat of power. At the seat of power. <laughs> <laughs> so let me begin with you, uh, Mr. Chiku. First of all, those two figures, the World Bank's figures and the president's figures. How do both, both uh, figures hit you? Um, when I look at those fig two figures, I could actually relate with where they are coming from. The president was very specific when he talked about lifting 10.5 million people out of poverty. He said they've created 2.5 million jobs uh, through household uh, peasant farming uh, credit facilities, which the central bank has been granting. And that those 2.5 million uh, households have, are employing 5 million people, 5% 5, 5 each. That's how he arrived at his about 10.5 million people that he felt had been lifted out of poverty. So what you basically do is that when you create employment and or you create businesses that are creating jobs, then those jobs will pay salaries and wages to people who are employed. And if those people were previously unemployed and not earning income, certainly they by virtue of any income, may be able to escape the poverty line. That's what the president said. So I could relate with what he said. But that does not take away the fact that we are seeing increasing level of poverty in the country. Because if you look at what World Poverty Clock said, they said about 98 million Nigerians are now living in abject poverty. They are living below $1.9 per day, which is, a, which, is a, yeah, which is a minimum threshold for you to be averagely well off. So, if you, like you said, that's almost 50% of the Nigerian population because the population is about 206 million people. And if you recognize the fact that over the past six years, our, our economy has been structuring. We've seen two recessions. We've seen periods where we saw growth, growth was below the population growth rate. So, over time, because the economy is expanding at the rate lower than the rate at which the population is growing, the number of people who are going to poverty is increasing. And like World Bank said, it's worsened by the fact that our purchasing power is being eroded. You did mention that. So if today, uh, if last year you're, you're in the same level of income, and last year you could buy a product for 100 naira, today you have to buy that product at 117 naira, 93 kobo. So that means that unless your income has grown by 17.93%, your standard of living would have deteriorated because you can no longer afford the same quantity of goods and services that you used to afford with that level of income. So what has happened that those whose income have remained stagnant have seen their standard of living continuously eroded. And some of them have been pushed into poverty because as your income gets eroded, the ability, the ability to demand for goods and services get declined. And you may get to a point where you cannot even live standard. I mean, your standard of living will worsen to the point you will become extremely poor. Remember, Mr. Chuku, don't forget that we are also in a pandemic which means that many people, are, many have lost their jobs, and those who still have their jobs are lucky to be paid what they were earning pre-pandemic. 
So people's salaries have also reduced. Yes, absolutely. You know, it, it, it's, it's unfortunate for Nigerian because there are several people who have lost their job, like you like said. We are dealing with an unemployment rate of 3.3%, which means of the 116 million people who are in the labor force, 33.3% of them are not employed. They have nothing to yield. It's not that they are, uh, it's not where you have, they are underemployed. We are talking of unemployed. So if you take an average of 100 million, you are saying more than 33 million of Nigerians do not have any, do not know where the next meal will come from. Okay, Mr. Fashua. Um, so, sorry, Alera, I, I want to, I just want to, um, I don't know, it's not funny, but humor me, Mr. Chuku. When you said the abject poverty is according to the world poverty clock, and you are right, that uh, is when one, the number of people who cannot spend up to $1.90 a day. That's almost $2. Mm -hmm. How much is a dollar now? Okay. A thousand naira. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Uh, I'm, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Fashwa, how many people in Nigeria mm. from your, you are an economist, so you probably have figures you can hash. I try. Can make, have access to up to 500 naira a day. Remember, well, okay, um, we are bringing up the issue of um, what they call purchasing power parity um, in economics. Um, uh, because a dollar, a dollar here can go a long distance, <laughs> a much longer distance compared with America, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, usually the concept of PPP is okay, um, but has, is, has also been flawed in many ways. People say, um, you, you're comparing, you know, when they, when they do the, con the analysis, they say, oh, how much is a burger in New York? And a burger in New York, maybe $2, maybe $3. You know, so, but how much is a burger in, in Nigeria? Lagos. Okay, so if you want to buy a burger in Lagos, probably go to, well, I can't advertise for companies here, yeah, but mm. those are the high-end people where mm. you can go and buy one for 5,000 naira and so on. Uh, but people now say, look, you one know. One burger, 5,000 naira? Uh, well, I don't eat that more. I don't eat such things. But I don't want to mention <laughs> things. Now, there are places where you buy it like that in this country. What? Um, so, but the issue then becomes, well, but is burger the, the staple food in Nigeria? No. So if people would wake up and eat akara and 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 pap, cocoa. for example, or cocoa, whatever, you know, but they don't relate with that in, in America. So you find out that a Nigerian can live on a, 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 a whole lot less. And right. secondly, what that brings up also is that when you're talking about the number of people that are poor, they're talking about households as well. So if you say that you want to have one dollar ninety per person, uh, that means that one dollar ninety, including children. Now, then, however, what they do is to average it across the year, all right? So um, the father should be able to spend a dollar ninety on that child, including their education, uh, every day okay. for the whole year, 365 days. So that's so how it's it not works. just about feeding. Yeah, it's not just about feeding. So okay. if, you, if the father cannot spend one dollar ninety per child for their education, for their needs, for their feeding, mm -hmm throughout the year, and then you say, okay, this guy is below, the family as a whole is under the poverty line. But okay. um, before now, you were mentioning quite a few things, um, um, you know, because what we find ourselves under is a multi-dimensional inflation. Uh, so everywhere that inflation can come, it's coming into Nigeria. It's coming from the supply side, you know, companies last year were shut down, bringing in raw materials and technology and equipment from abroad to produce became a problem. It became a lot more expensive. Naira has been devalued about 35 to 40 percent or thereabouts, at least from 305 to 410 now, officially. And of course, on the streets, for most most producers, most importers, most traders have to go to the streets to buy. And luckily, I heard it's gone back to about 483. It passed 500 um, a couple of, about a week ago. You know, so, so that means that the, the fact that Naira is now devalued, then you import inflation because the country is still an import-dependent economy. The, you know, our import, surprisingly, our import grew by 54% last year in spite of the snafu in 
um, in, in trade, in international trade, in spite of, of course, they said shipping wasn't quite affected, but there was a time that even the Nigerian ports had to kind of, you know, shrink its, its operations massively. So you are importing inflation by way of devaluation. If there's inflation in the countries that you are importing from, you bring out back that there are inflation. Supply side snafus, the fact that companies cannot produce and companies have to increase their prices in order to, 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 to compensate for the shutdowns that mm. they had and all the challenges they have, you know, that also takes inflation in. Then what the president has said, the interventions as a result of the neo-Keynesianism that we are now practicing around the world, a kind of neo-Keynesianism whereby, you know, governments are spending money, intervening, sending money to people, which is true. So the president does have a point that they've spent quite a bit of money through AXMIS giving to people, through um, anchor borrowers, through all sorts of intervention. Money is being pushed out. But you see, when money is pushed out in that way, and people just suddenly find that they have money, and you know, where do they spend, and everything they're buying, you know. So the few people who are producing also increase their prices. So, what so you the, can the, see that inflation is coming at us from several angles. Whether on the demand side, on the supply side, on the import side, on the on the devaluation essentially, side, essentially you are um, saying, Mr. Yeah. Fashua, that uh, the figures are not matching the reality of the people. Well, not exactly. I'm saying that it's it, it, you know what we have established here is actually what they call complexity economics. It, uh, if you, you can know, just Johnson break it said, down, help, said, help help so help my yes, okay. just one second. Right, okay, so you. let me make it a. a Clear question. Do the figures match the reality of Nigeria? The figures actually almost match it, okay? Um, there'll be plus or minus, okay? But we have established some facts here, okay? The fact that indeed government spent money. That releases money into the society. But what is that money buying? So you see money chasing fewer production. And we have also established that companies were finding it difficult to produce. And the little they produce, they increase the prices. Ordinarily, pure water Mr. 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 Johnson. is now 29. Just, just to say, Mr. Yeah. Johnson, do the figures match the reality? As, as both as a Nigerian and as MD of a company. As an economist. OK, let, let me get your question right. <laughs> When you talk of do the, the uh, figures match the reality, mm -hmm. you are saying that the job that the government has created is it reflecting in the society. The figures that government is bandying. Yes. The, okay. The, do they match yes, what the experience that yeah, people are see, having when, on the when streets? We talk, which, when, I, when we talk of, that's why I say that if you are talking about the job that government said they've created, mm -hmm. is it reflecting in the public? Is it reflecting in the society? Can the economy feel it? That's your question. Okay. And my take is this. If... You have to recognize the fact that, look, if you create 10.5 million jobs and addition 30 million people go out of jobs, it doesn't take away the fact that you've created 10.5 million jobs, but you have a net deficit of 20 million jobs. Just the same way the inflation figures and uh, the um, population figures are, at par are, are not at par. Yes, I'll come back to that. So what we are looking at that, in as much as government may have created specific jobs. If I wasn't working yesterday and I got a job today, the government can say Johnson Chukwu has started working. Okay? Sure. But it could also follow that Sister Lero, I, you, yourself, and Shola have lost their jobs. So of the four of us, Johnson is working, but three persons have lost their jobs. In effect, the economy is suffering from three percent loss of three uh, person against one person. So in effect, we have a deficit of three. That's exactly what we're dealing with today. The economy is growing at a very slow rate. A couple of factors, including exogenous, external factors, and endogenous factors, internal factors, are pushing a lot of people out of jobs, creating high level of employment. So if you create specific jobs in some sectors, but the number of people who are losing their, who have lost their job within that period are more than those who have gotten jobs, yes. then the economy is suffering from a deficit of job creation. Mm -hmm. And that is why you cannot see it at the macro level. At the micro level, the individual that got a job will be dancing around, I've gotten a job. So the people... But the public, cannot see it because we're seeing despair, loss of jobs, loss of income, increasing level of poverty, mm. increasing level of unemployment. Yeah. Talking about the increasing level of poverty, we were talking about government giving out, okay, the anchor borrowers yeah, and all this stuff, and, that yeah. and all that. But what are the people spending that money on? I heard something that shocked me yesterday, that in the markets, yam is actually being sold in slices. Yeah. Because people can't afford to buy a tuba of yam. Yeah. Mm. I'd never heard that happen in mm. this country before. Mm. That shows you the level of poverty of the people. Yeah. 
when they cannot buy one tuba of yam. They cannot buy a paint bucket of Gary because it is now 1,700 exactly. Naira. That's the inflation. For what them. they used to buy for 800. Mm -hmm. So what is this money that government is giving out doing to the persons who are receiving it? How is it improving their lives? Well, I think, like, like Johnson has said, you know, the, um, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you intervene with 10.5 million people and 33 million or 40 million people have lost their job, you still have a huge deficit. And the point so is you that haven't done anything. The, the 10 million people that you have intervened with probably will be able to assist to an extent informally because that's what we call social capital in Nigeria. Maybe they reach out to 15 million people here and there which may not be captured by the data that they've actually given out money to these people. That may not be captured in the data uh, as to who and who they are assisting. But what we have here is stagflation. Stagflation. That's a stagnant economy and hyperinflation on the other side. What then means that, you see, that maybe if the, the bottom 10 million that are not being reached, and that's a lot of numbers, the bottom 10, 15, 20 million that are not being reached at all, Okay, maybe down deep down there in the villages or somewhere, or even urban poverty is even worse. The bottom 10, 20, 15 million that are not being reached at all have now, you know, their fate is now a lot worse. Imagine if you had nothing, fine. And so you probably ask if somebody has zero, how can inflation affect them? All right. Uh, but if somebody had 100 naira and 18 18 percent inflation, almost 18 percent. What it means is that, <clears throat> technically speaking, you know, it's as good as 82 naira that you, just, you have. You just reminded, so, me, you just so, reminded me of a Yoruba proverb that I don't want to say in public. Yeah, please, is, I, no, no, I don't okay, want to. But we'll take a break okay. and uh, we'll continue this conversation right now. Well, thanks for staying with us. Um, gentlemen, there is something that we have heard over and over again. Um, we, the, the issues, the problem is big. <laughs> the issues are out there and the figures, as you economists tell us, don't lie. But there is also something that we've heard over and over again. And that's the fact that the private sector has a crucial role to play in solving all of this problem. Um, especially the um, unemployment problem, at least to a large extent. So, let me ask you, what are the challenges that you know are clear and present for the private sector to even be enabled to create jobs or to employ people, to take up some of those unemployment challenges that the problem has. Because clearly the federal government or the state governments can't employ everybody. Yeah. So what are those challenges mitigating? Okay, I'm going to add to your preamble before I go to the challenges. And that is, there is a private sector that will create employment and reduce the level of unemployment, reduce the level of poverty. And some countries have done it well. And one of the things I have always emphasized, we should move away from relief-focused poverty alleviation to development-focused poverty uh, reduction. Mm -hmm. Relief-focused poverty alleviation is where you think you give handouts. I'll, buy, I'll give a child one meal in a day, mm -hmm. but the child left home in the morning. He didn't eat in the morning. He won't eat in the, afternoon, in the evening. His father cannot pay rent. He can't buy clothing for him. The mother has not eaten. So, if you are granting relief and you think you will take people out of poverty, which has never happened anywhere in the world, China changed their own approach in 1982, and that led to the immediate transformation of China. So we need to focus on development. And that takes us to the, your question. What do we need to encourage the private sector to be very strong in the economy and create jobs? One is policy environment. And it has to come from the fiscal authorities. Policy environment as it relates to what is a policy. Let's even start from the elephant in the, in the, in the, in the China uh, way, issue of insecurity. People have investments. As I, as Lagos is the only oasis we have today. Outside Lagos and Abuja, you can't go to so many states in the country. So you have to deal with that. It has to come from fiscal policies of the government, from the executive arm of the government. Second issue. Government being federal or state? At the federal level, the issue of insecurity has to be, be, be dealt at the federal level. The states have minimal impact on when it comes to the level of pervasive insecurity we have in the country today. Second issue is the issue of uh, infrastructure supply. Take the issue of transport infrastructure. Logistic infrastructure, including the seaports. Then you look at energy infrastructure, power supply. These are three critical elements you need to address if you have to 
and call it private sector to operate. A couple of countries have done it well. When we talk of China, I'm not going to talk about China. I'm just going to talk of a country like uh, um, uh, these other Southeast Asian countries that have done so well within a period that we started our own reforms. So we need to address infrastructure. Two is our legal system. I mean, the third factor is our legal system. Contract enforcement. Time it takes to, uh, then you have to talk of the regulatory environment, bureaucracy, time it takes to register title, time it takes to incorporate the business, time it takes to get permits. Essentially talking about ease of doing business. Yes, yeah, ease of doing business. But, but we have been talking about that, Johnson, and we have said that we have made that better. Uh, what I mean, we the vice president was the great champion of that in this government. Okay, let me, let, let me come in, Sister Larry. Mm. At some point, we were moving on the ease of doing business. Mm. After the first term of the current government, we froze. And some of the milestones we achieved in the first term, including improving the time it takes you to uh, get visa, I mean visa and arrival. I can't, if I, maybe I forgot it. Can you remind me of any new policy that has come up in the past two years? that are focused on addressing the ease of doing business. But the, so, the, what, what we understand, my, my apologies, Mr. Chico, what we understand, Mr. Fashua, is that the, the, the Office of the Vice President, PEBEC, the Presidential Enabling Business Environment um, Committee or Council, um, had two, just two um, states. Um, they, 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 they worked with the first bank, the World Bank, mm -hmm. to try to facilitate ease of doing business in at least two sample states, hoping that that could be replicated in other states. What, what do you think first of all that? Well, great stuff, you know. The, the, uh, my, my school of thought in economics is a bit um, left of center, um, I must say. And uh, I also know that um, sometimes late last year, the World Bank itself slowed down on the ease of doing business index as well, and um, felt that, look, they had been going on and on. It wasn't quite measuring the things that needed to be measured. Uh, you know, just focusing on ease of doing business does not actually move the development needle as well. You know, the kind of things that there are 10 indices in there, and some of them are a little bit tangential, okay? For example, cross-border trade, ease of paying taxes, and so on, which, in fact, I, I had written articles in the past saying that, look, perhaps we need to tweak this ourselves. Uh, it, it may not be a big deal registering a company, but when you register that company as a young man, but through politics and corruption, you can't get a single job with that nice company that you have incorporated. So what's the point? So, but how are we addressing the politics, the corruption, the frustrations, <laughs> the double taxations, you know, the harassment, and the fact that there's no, like he said, the infrastructure backup and the, what they call the, the, the um, uh, enabling environment in Nigeria. So I belong to a certain school of thought, uh, which is, well, my own idea, that what we need right now is that we haven't provided the foundation for business in this country, okay, which is what they call the public goods in economics. So when... Without, without security, you can't do any business. Look at how large Nigeria is. Take a flight in Nigeria in a propeller engine plane and you look at the lay of the land. We're not occupying 10% of the, of the land mass. We're not farming 20% of the land mass. So I say, if you fold up Nigeria today and say, sorry, we can't do it anymore, uh, back to sender, it's going to, be, it's going to be, the epitaph is going to be labeled, returned on open, because we never actually walked the potentials of this country, per se. Oh, no, you know what I'm saying? So... The basic issues is what they got right in the West, and even in, the, in, the, in Southeast Asia and other places. You can't fix security, nothing is going to happen. How do you then fix security? Of course, you can look at technology, but you can also look at people. So you have to, and so, whereas the private sector can provide the, the employment for people, but what we haven't done is that we haven't actually populated the core sectors, we, we haven't manned the core sectors in the public sector with the people, and we cannot now go and import technology to supervise everybody when everybody is going hungry. So it's so not a problem. People, it's so not a need, problem of policy. It is a policy problem. In fact, it is solely a policy problem. But you what, need, you, you need, talked about you need, people. You need, just you a second. To, yes, you, okay. you talked about people. So yeah. if we have policies, amazing, fantastic, excellent policies, with the right people. Yeah. No, no, the people are there. Look, 200 million people. The people that will fix this country are here. The young people are looking for jobs. Youth unemployment is 42%. 42%. 
We're not talking about the, you know, the core unemployment, general employment, 33.3%, youth unemployment, 42%. On, you know, underemployment is 22.8%. So if you look at the youth alone, in that bracket, you're looking at about 60-something 60, 60 percent of unemployment and underemployment, the young people of this country walking about the place. I'm talking about security. Talk about the environmental sector. Give, give a German this country, give the Europeans, give the Americans, give the Chinese this country, and they'll probably transform it in three years. All right, you know, so we're talking about the environmental sector, the security sector, the educational sector. You have 15 million children on the streets that none of us should be able to sleep. Because not only have we messed it up up till now, it looks like even the future is totally jeopardized. Okay. So how do you, how do you take care of 15 million people? You need two things. Sorry, I was, just one second. Two things. Number one, you need to put those children in school. That means you need to expand education. That means you need teachers. A lot of the young people that are being pushed into entrepreneurship, they just go and sell anything you can sell. You know, you're not, entrepreneurship should be based on innovation, not survival. So we're going into entrepreneurship just to survive. Many of them should be teachers earning 40,000, 50,000 in MENA, in somewhere, in, you know, and, 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 and doing something and adding value by until they move on. And secondly, the United States has 680,000 social workers. Okay? These are social workers that are put in charge of seven, eight young people in foster care, in different in taking children off the streets putting them in families, you open a fire for them, you go to visit them, make sure that they are okay, they are attending school, they are eating well, they are getting their medicals done and all that. 15 million is, you probably need a brand new social services sector. So now, if you don't do social services, you don't do education, you don't do security, okay. you don't do environment, and uh, then you say uh, that... Mr. Fasha, just, just one second. Have have and so you have to put money okay. in people's pockets, actually. Now, uh, Mr. Chuku, you, you, started, you said something the other time, and I think it is quite instructive. And perhaps it's a good way to, to go for the whole nation. You talked about survival, uh, existential or survival, you know, economy versus developmental economy. And it's a function of planning. You mentioned that earlier. So this is 2021. Um, we, started talking, we started talking about the Fourth Republic in 1999. This is 2021. 22 years after. If you were to project another 20 or 22 years from now, talking about the development that you mentioned earlier, what are the critical things we need to do as well as a timeline with which we need to do them so that we do not find ourselves in a much worse situation than we are now? Okay, I will start from the next generation of Nigerians. I had a meeting at some point when uh, Ellen Sheriff was the president of Liberia. And she mentioned at that meeting that they lost a generation as a country. Nigeria is close to that situation where we can say we have lost a generation of young Nigerians. So what I will do is I'll go backwards to make sure we don't lose another generation. I will start with the educational system. I will review the curriculum and introduce current educational curriculum, which is STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And I will go start it from the uh, nursery state level up to secondary and university level. So we're going to build a generation of Nigerians that in the next, remember what happens that if you have quality education, it begins to manifest after 10 years. Because that's when the graduates, those, they would have coming out of high school and they will be coming with skills. So that's the first focus. Get it right, catch them wrong and get it right with the educational system. Second issue will be the infrastructure build up. We need to build the infrastructure that will support development, that will support productivity. Such Today, as, to be specific? Transport infrastructure is very critical. Energy infrastructure is very critical. Logistic, infra logistic infrastructure is very critical. When I talk of logistic infrastructure is that one of the things that China did was it focused on the western uh, zones of its country and where they have seaports. And it built world-class seaports so that it could produce and export. And that attracted investors from outside of China to come and invest in certain of manufacturing factories. It's not just they were looking for population of China. The first set of companies that came to China and wanted to build in China and they export out of China. We don't have the logistics for export. Uh, Tokme had mentioned the issue of logistic bottleneck we have at the seaports. You come in, bring Nigeria goods into the country, it takes you almost as long as it takes you to ship it from Antwerp to Nigeria to take it out from uh, Papa Port to your warehouse. We don't even have export terminals. So we need to address that. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, power infrastructure, we started the Power Reform uh, Act the process. It had all, it's almost more than 10 years we've done that, and we've not seen improvement in power supply. We need to go back and look at that model and see if it's working, hmm. and probably tweak it 
to make it work. If you don't have energy, let me tell you, Ayo, everything on earth runs on energy, be it living or inanimate objects. The AC here is working on energy, run on energy. You and I are running on energy because without energy, nothing for sure. So if we don't get the energy right, we're not going to ever be a productive economy. Mm -hmm. I mentioned education. Then the next fourth aspect will be on health care. If you address education, infrastructure, health care, security, then you get this economy working. When I talk, um, he just, when he was talking now, something just crossed my mind that many manufacturers moved to China after China had fixed itself up yeah. because of the availability of cheap labor. Absolutely. You could say yeah. that you can find cheap labor in Nigeria. Yeah. So what is preventing us from putting other things into place yeah. so that manufacturers can also come and manufacture and ship out from here? Well, okay, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very intricate game. It's, 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 it's not as easy as, you know, China, of the very smart people, and I mean, we're talking of civilizations that used to have been around for 5,000 years. Or so a lot, of the, a lot of the technology that the West, like, uh, you know, capitalized on in the first industrial revolution were actually taken from the East as well. There's what's called the East-West pendulum by which the economic power shift from the Eastern hemisphere to the Western and back and so on. And so they were able to position to gain from globalization when the Americans and the Europeans felt that the heavy lifting of manufacturing uh, should be outsourced to countries that can, you know. But of course, these days too, they see, we have seen an uptick in, in wages in China uh, and now under Trump, for example, he was always saying, look, we need to take these jobs back, you know, to, for our people because it seemed like they had left a whole lot of people, uh, you know, in the base, uh, you know, they had left them to their own fate in, even in America, you know. So um, we have the numbers, um, but we haven't actually given as much training and orientation to our numbers as the Chinese did that made it easy for, 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 for te even technology companies to move to, the, to, the, to China mm -hmm. and be able to produce there because you, know, you have to have got mm -hmm. their minds into a certain framework. They work like machines for almost next to nothing. At the beginning, it was 1 20th of the wages that were being paid in the West was what the companies were paying in the East. Later, it became 1 tenth. Now, it's, it's looking a bit um, dicey. So those companies are trying to move back. So, that's what uh, Mr. Johnson said. In education, education. Look, the biggest investment we can make in terms of return on investment in this country is the education of our children. Ten years of, look, it takes a lot of investment. So the issue then becomes a balance. If the governors want to be able to put two, two billion naira worth of cars on the streets and run around in convoys and build, every time you look at the achievement, they say, well, we just built a fantastic governor's lodge you know, a wonderful presidential lodge, which nobody lives in. So it's a, it's a choice. Otherwise, you find out that the, it's, it's, a, it's a big investment you have to make and sacrifice you have to make to say, let me shut my eyes to my own convenience and my own safety. Let's take these children of the sea. Let's, let's, even in the south of Nigeria, we could do a whole lot more in terms of educating our children. In terms he of, mentioned STEM, in, for in example. Terms of education. Very, very important. In, in terms of education, um, I would ask you, because I think... You run a, a business, you, you run a business as well. Every business would have a focus, right. has a vision of, okay, this is what this organization you know, is going to achieve. So even if we say pump money into education, right. into healthcare and all those yeah. things, what is the focus? What is the end game? What is the Nigerian vision? The, the, that which this spending is going to provide yeah. or produce for Nigeria in 10 years. <laughs> is the mind you are investing in. 10 years. 10 years of transforming the mindset. Look. And, 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 transforming and on the a, mindset yes, to and what on, ends. And, uh, just a second. An and uneducated mind, okay, certainly does just not deliver as much to society as it should. So if you gave me a, 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 a toddler today, and you ensure that that toddler begins to go to school in 10 years, begins to think in a different manner. That was what China did. That was what America, Europe, that was what they did. Thinking in a different mind. That, look, you know the problem we have now, especially in some parts of the country, is some people believe there is a class system. And so um, we need people to be allowed in the market. All right? 
<laughs> yes, that's it. We need people to be to be to be shoemakers. We need people to be mebola. We need people to to be to be a merua and co. You know, and so you know, so you think it's, it's class. planned. But you don't understand that we will, you would you would be able to create systems and technology that would deliver the water, take your refuse, and do all of that. But that child should be a prodigy in some area in technology or whatever, even in the arts, to think for the people and cooperate. I would go with the STEM idea, but I would, I, if I had my way, I would ensure every child studies history in this country and every child studies sociology to understand different cultures and diversity in this country from get-go. I tell you what, so it's, it's, it's an investment that our leaders are, you know, unready. They're not ready to make that investment because it's a case of pay, paying billions and billions every month, billions and trillions every year, but in time, you'll be shocked how this country it will sounds. transform. That's the best investment you can make. Mm. And once you do that, the money people, these rich guys, that we have people in this country with good money. They will move in on the infrastructure. If, even the diaspora will invest in infrastructure bond, this country will transform. But again, you see that many of the infrastructure we're doing, we leave it to Chinese. They will bring the people that will do it. They will bring the laborers that will do the work. They will bring the equipment. They will bring everything. And say, oh, yeah, we're, great stuff. We start in their board. We must begin to in, in, you know, include our children, our youth, our young people, and then the finance will come and we'll, they would have ownership of the development of this country. This, this is really, really interesting, and I just hope someone was taking notes so that we can come up with the policy. Why are you looking at me like that? Mm -hmm. well, I have to thank Good you. <laughs> I have to thank you very much, gentlemen, for being a part of this conversation. Topo Fashua, an economist, as well as uh, Johnson Chuku, who is MD, Curry Asset Management Limited. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being a part of this conversation. Thank you very Our much. pleasure. Yes. So we continue after this break to stay with us.